Hello everyone, and welcome to video number five, in which we're going to be looking at paleocynecology, or the reconstruction of past ecosystems. And I split, split this into two fairly quite different chunks. Fairly quite different, that's terrible English. Never mind, here we are. Um, fairly different chunks. So I wanted to look at, in this video, first, how we can look at ecosystems in deep time thinking about those as ecosystems themselves and, and how fossilization may Im be impacting on our view of those ecosystems. And then I'll look at the, the more traditional approach to paleoecology or paleocynecology, which has been using these past ecosystems as a tool to understand the environment of deposition of a rock. So let's go ahead and let's first look at past ecosystems as ecosystems in and of themselves and think about our understanding of th those. So the first thing we have to consider as paleontologists if we want to understand a fossilized ecosystem is to consider the biases that fossil preservation uh, imprints upon our ecosystem or the picture we can recover from the fossil record of our ecosystem. This reflects a thing called taphonomy. Um, that's the, the way um, by which living organisms become fossilized. An obvious bias we may want to consider as an example is the fact that hard parts in organisms tend to preserve quite easily in the fossil record, whereas soft parts don't. So we can assess um, the impact that has in a number of ways. And one of those is to look at the similarity of the thing called a death assemblage to its living counterpart. Now, a death assemblage is the collection of organisms found in a different place and position than they occupied in life, such as disarticulated shells. So this is the majority of what we see in the fossil record. And we can compare that to its living counterpart to assess its fidelity in, the, in a few different ways. A really nice example that's been found in a series of detailed studies of the living and dead faunas of the Copana Bay and the Lugu Laguna Madre along the Texas coast was done by George Staff and colleagues. So I've put the um, a relevant reference on the slide for you here from 1986, actually, so quite an old piece of work here, which probed the paleoecological significance of the taphonomy of a variety of nearshore communities and looked at those samples over a number of different years. Some of the headline findings from this which are really interesting is that most animals in living communities are not usually preserved. Okay, so most things that are around for whatever reason, for example, they, ha they are mostly made of soft parts, are unlikely to be preserved. However, the majority of animals that have a preservation potential, that's shelled organisms, do in fact enter the fossil record. Okay, so this was all assessed by looking at the living communities in these areas and what was found in the sediment. More of these organisms as a proportion were found in the death assemblages than in living assemblages, suggesting that there was an impact of time averaging that was clearly significant. So as things die, their shells hang around for a long time, and that increases the amount of um, hard stuff, hard shelled things that we f we would imagine in an ecosystem. And those shelled organisms tend to be suspension feeders and informal creatures, things that are living in the sediment, which are most likely to be preserved. And what this diagram here shows you is how that modifies the paleoecological signal we will see as a result of the process of fossilization. So in each one of these examples, be it Capana Bay or Laguna Madre, you can see as a circle, the living assemblage, as a triangle, the potential death assemblage, that's things that could be preserved, and as a black or, or um, clear square, the death assemblage. And on this graph, you can see that we generally go from down here to up here through the fossilization process. The living ecosystems have lots of detritivores and herbivores in them, um, and we can see those when we're looking at the living ecosystems because they're extant. However, if we look at only the things that are preserved in the sedimentary record, there's a far higher proportion of suspension feeders that we would see. So this bias is impacting on the paleocin ecological um, takeaway message that we would, we would get from this fossil assemblage. So I think it's a really attractive study. And one of the reasons 
it is a relatively old study is that I've struggled to find um, any um, more recent papers that do this kind of work up until uh, 2020. But like a number of other subdisciplines I introduce over the course of these videos, this is an area in which computational approaches have great promise. And I, in kind of in the world of paleocynicology, those kind of new um, paleo um, compute, computational approaches have really kicked off since 2020. The graphs on this slide are taken from one example of Shaw et al., which was published in 2021. This paper quantified in a number of ways how fossilization impacts inferences of ancient community structure and what the community structure of some Lagerstätten was. But I wanted to focus for our purposes today on actually the, um, the impact of fossilization and not on their analysis of different Lagerstätten. The graph that you can see on the top here is an example of one of their results. This quantifies how our picture of well-documented extant food webs changes when we just remove members of these food webs as we would do in fossilization towards the right of the x-axis. This is what that percentage loss, no loss means. On the left here, here are all of the living organisms and all of uh, we consider all of their interactions. And as we gradually remove them, we see what happens um, going uh, towards the right on the x-axis. And so what this is in effect doing is pseudo-fossilizing a known ecosystem. The y-axis here represents the trophic level on average of the organisms that you see. So the higher you are on this y-axis, the higher up in the food chain you are. The higher you are on a food web, the more likely you are to say be a predator. Um, and as you can see, um, that as you go from the left to the right on these graphs, most clearly in this one um, from this ecosystem on the far right hand side here, each one of these is a different extant ecosystem. In general, trophic level appears to reduce. That makes more sense. There are more producers and there are consumers in any given ecosystem. And so as you um, remove things, you, you are likely to create a more bottom heavy picture of your ecosystems. But those authors also share, show that there is a systematic pattern to the distribution of trophic level between organisms with different preservation potential. And that's what this graph here shows. So to choose this example from the right hand side again, you can see that as we go from soft on the left here to hard on the right here, um, you in general go from a lower trophic level to a higher one. It's not a perfect pattern, but it is one that is repeated across the majority of our different living ecosystems, okay? That means when there is a selective rather than a land, random loss of individuals, because hard-bodied taxa tend to have higher trophic levels, um, we see the loss of trophic levels um, that occurs with the removal of nodes being delayed. You need a higher level of loss to get the same apparent reduction. But more generally, this, they've shown that this process makes ecosystems look less stable through the selective removal of relatively poorly preserved taxa, which generally have lower trophic levels. So lower trophic levels removed, you have a top heavy um, ecosystem and that makes it look less stable. Okay? It's a really nice example of how we can take a really information rich living set of different food webs, community structures, and play with them in a computer to understand what impact fossilization may have. And I've just chosen one of the many interesting results that they have in that paper to show you here. So if you want to learn more about it, please do check out this paper from Shaw et al. It's a really nice piece of work. I wanted to finish by highlighting that these same authors are further developing this kind of approach. And this is a second publication that's available as a preprint. So do be aware that this hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but it's still, um, it's out there and it's publicly available. A tool that can use functional trait data to reconstruct ancient food webs. So by functional trait data, what I mean is characteristics that are predictive of interactions in modern ecosystems. And those are commonly available also for fossil organisms. The traits that these particular authors use encompass motility, the ability to move, tearing, where organisms live in the water column, because this is looking at marine organisms, 
feeding, what things eat, and size. And then it goes on in a, a process that <coughs> follows these five steps that are shown here, but the details for our purposes don't really matter, goes on to um, work out all potential interactions between all of the species. So as an example, we can assume that non-motile taxa are considered unable to consume motile species because anything that can move can escape from anything that can't move. Okay, so that's one potential interaction that we know works one way but not the other. They show that through this process and the steps that they have derived for, for this model, that food webs can be reasonably approximated by inferring trophic interactions based upon those traits. So it's a really exciting approach to computationally build up a picture of long extinct food webs and to better understand both how those operated and how those changed through time and, for example, across mass extinctions. So I guess watch this space. I'm sure there's more exciting stuff coming. So that's my first bit of this video in which we're we have focused on how we can look at past ecosystems as ecosystems in the past. But I also wanted to talk over the course of this video about how we have traditionally studied paleoecology. So let's move on to that. So despite these known biases that I've mentioned, we can use the fossil assemblages we find in any given site to tell us about the likely environment in which a rock was deposited. And this has been the traditional application of paleocynecology, though it wasn't always called this. As an example, if we choose our marine shelf ecosystem, again, the same one as I talked to you about in the last video, we can split these shelves into a number of zones that go from shallow, shown up here, down to deep, based on the fauna, that is the animals, that are present at those different depths because the composition of our animal community changes with the associated environmental gradients. So what I was talking about in the last video, we are now applying to um, fossil assemblages in this video. We need to kind of formalize this for that to be a useful tool. And so what we do is we place these animal um, communities into a number of broadly defined groups, which we can term either benthic assemblages. These are assemblages of benthic animals. That's animals that live on the seafloor. Or we can call them biophages. And I've put a definition for that of that on the slide for you here. But for our purposes, it's just worth noting that there are six benthic assemblages, which can be identified by combining multiple classes of evidence. We can understand these benthic assemblages by looking at the rocks associated with these fossils, the taphonomy of those fossils, that is how they are preserved, the macroinvertebrates um, that are preserved as fossils, that's the animal communities themselves, and also um, characteristics related to the trace fossils that we find at different depths, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides time. I've included um, more details, probably more than you ever want, below this video on the website, um, which you can have a look at to get, kind of get a feel for what I'm actually talking about here. And this diagram here shows how these benthic assemblages 1 to 6 map to the depth of a continental shelf. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, obviously, understanding sea level change is essential for geologists and those for try trying to understand the Earth and environmental system more widely. For example, if we want to understand how sea level change and climatic fluctuations have interacted with each other, we need to be able to talk about sea levels at different parts, at uh, different times in the Earth's history. And so we can do this using our biofacies. A couple of the key water depth levels that we can tell from these biofacies are the fair weather wave base. This is a, a, a water depth of about 10 meters. Above this, um, in normal weather, um, there is wave action, and below this, you get less wave action. And this is usually found at the base of benthic assemblage number two. Some sediments above that show a particular animal community and evidence of persistent wave activity. The effective storm wave base, that's the, um, the, the depth to which um, storm waves reach at their maximum, is generally 50 meters, though it can vary up to 100 meters. It varies depending on um, the exposure of the coastline, for example, and other factors. But we can tell that depth for, by the um, boundary between benthic assemblage four and five. Okay, so that gives us 
even a, a rough estimate of somewhere between 50 to 100 meters of water depth when we see that shift between benthic assemblages four and five. And that's a very useful thing for us to know as geologists. All of this is overprinted by factors such as evolution. So biofacies are fairly broad in their scope and they, they become more nuanced when we consider not only the impact of evolution that I just mentioned, but also how, how the makeup of fossil communities at different depths shifts through time. So these on this slide are examples of two communities from the Ordovician period. So that's a, a little bit over 400 million years ago. On the left, you can see a shallow marine upper Ordovician communities. And this is generally made of bivalves and brachiopods and bryozoa. These are colonial animals um, that you find a lot in the Paleozoic, though they're still alive today. On the right hand side, you can see an outer shelf um, sediment from the upper Ordovician. And this is represented by a community which has a higher diversity brachiopod and trilobite association. As such, with a great deal of study, we can start through these ideas to, to untangle changes in environmental conditions in the fossil record from geography and from evolution. And that can help us understand how environmental conditions change in deep time and how the groups that are alive respond to it writ large. We'll look at that more in the next video. But I just wanted to finish by highlighting that we can do the same thing with trace fossils. So, so far, I've mostly been talking about body fossils. That's the, the fossils of the bits or the whole body or the cadaver of an organism. But those body fossils will rarely give us information about the behavior of an organism, short of things like functional morphology, where we look at the shape of bits to understand um, what those things do, as I mentioned in video number three. But we can also use trace fossils. So I've put some pictures of trace fossils on the slide for you here, and I've put a definition for you here. That is a biogenic sedimentary structure formed by the behavioral activity of an animal on or within a given substrate. And these can represent an actual animal behavior at the time that rock was still a soft, gooey sediment. So on the left-hand side here, you can see, I think, yes, a Cambrian example of a locomotion trace. This is the trace of something walking over a 500 or so million year old seafloor. In the middle is a locomotion but feeding trace. You can see how there's this branching structure to these, suggesting that whatever made this trace is systematically uh, moving up forwards and, and backwards and retracing its steps, feeding and locomoting and moving at the same time. And extensive work has been done using trace fossils, especially burrows, to determine the water depth at which a rock was deposited. Now it's worth highlighting before I move on that some traces can be relatively easily associated with her trace maker. So this is a, a fossil horseshoe crab that was just having a really bad day. It was knowing where this was deposited, probably um, it was swept into a really salty lagoon. It landed, it walked a bit and then it died. So pretty much the worst day that horseshoe crab ever had. And in this case, this trace you can see here, you can very clearly associate with this particular organism here. But in many cases, that is not true. We don't always know what organism made traces like this, but nevertheless, we can use the distribution patterns of the kind of traces that we see, even outside knowing what made those traces, to tell us about um, the depth of deposition of a rock. So this is supporting what we can get from animal communities. It's also worth noting that trace fossils get their own spe species name based upon their shapes, and that's what this slide here shows. So we complement the pointers we get from animal fossils with insights from trace fossils because of this predictable onshore to offshore gradient we get in intertidal environments to the deep sea of animal behavior. And we can organize these like we did with um, with organisms, with um, fauna, we place those into biofacies. We can organize trace fossils into ichnofacies that are developed on and within soft, unconsolidated sediments. And uh, uh, these ichnofacies are shown on this diagram here. For example, Skeletos, that you can see at this point here, is generally associated with higher energy conditions, with moving well-sorted sands. So this is a very shallow set of trace fossils that you associate with, with shallow water. Um, Cruziana, this is um, a, a, a collection of 
of different traces that are best developed below the normal fair weather wave base, but are just a little bit deeper than Skeletos. And this goes all the way down to Nereites here, which is associated with quiet but moderately well oxygenated seabeds. Um, so it's a general trend that some people find very useful, but it's also one that has been criticized in detail in some publications because um, behavior represents not only water depth, um, but all, the behavior recorded in the trace fossil record is also influenced by, for example, the substrate that that is on. For example, carbonate facies, that's um, rocks made of calcium carbonate, become hard very rapidly. And so um, that will impact on the behavior that we see in trace fossils. And they're also impacted by things like turbulence, sedimentation rate, availability of food and oxygen concentration in addition to depth. So take that as a warning. There's this general pattern, but there's a great deal of expertise required in reading what that pattern any means. Why is it important? Why am I telling you all of this? Well, actually, I wanted to finish this video by highlighting that, um, given this, paleoecology is vital because it tells us about the conditions in which a rock was deposited, and that matters because, um, for example, um, these paleo communities can be integral to understanding really big things about the geology and therefore the history of Earth. This slide shows you a series of cross-stratified, cross stratified, sorry, cross-bedded sandstones, okay? These could represent a fluvial environment. That means they could be have been deposited by a river. They could represent a tidal environment. That means they're um, uh, they are deposited in shallow marine settings, or they could even represent an aeolian or a desert, so land-based environment. And from the rock type alone, as shown by these three very different kinds of sandstone, um, but um, similar in terms of their sedimentary structures, we cannot tell those three environments apart. But if, for example, we find a marine bivalve or one of our biofacies, commu benthic assemblage communities, we can say that that rock must represent a tidal rather than a fluvial or aeolian deposition. If we find a freshwater organism, it must be a it must be sorry fluvial because it can't be deposited in a, in a desert and it can't be deposited in the sea. And so, in this case, whilst the sedimentary structures in these three rocks look very very similar, we can tell that this particular one here is fluvial. This one here is tidal, and this one here is aeolian. So putting much of what we've learned in this video together, that allows professional geologists to use fossils not to tell us only about the depth of deposition of a rock, but the firmness of the substrate, the rates of sedimentation, the paleo latitude and the paleo climate. And by applying this to multiple rocks, we can start building up a picture of continental interiors versus marine ecosystems in the past and use that to understand the history of life on Earth and the history of Earth. So in our last video, I wanted to highlight just some global trends that we can we can um, think about in terms of paleoecology that builds on this kind of thinking. So I'll see you there very, very shortly.